That one got me a little bit more out of breath than usual. It wasn't quite as long, so I had to do a little running. Yeah. <laughs> it's all right. I guess when there's no accompanist present, we have to sing things a little faster so that they don't drag and die. All right. Tonight, Lord willing, we're looking at Acts chapter 14, or excuse me, Acts chapter 15, verses 1 through 5, and uh, a very interesting thing is occurring in Acts chapter 15, the very first all-church council, the Council of Jerusalem. As you know, throughout history, there have been many different councils, the Council of Chalcedon, uh, the Council of Nicaea, and so on. But here we have the first council, the Council of Jerusalem, in Acts chapter 15, and verses 1 through 5. So if you'll take your Bibles and turn with me there, if you will, tonight we're going to be talking about what went on at the council. At least we'll talk about the first part of what went on at the council, because it is uh, rather significant that this issue keeps popping up throughout the book of Acts. And as we've seen, there's a, a great deal that needs to be said about it. It was the issue of the day. Acts chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, should go up to Jerusalem under the apostles and elders about this question. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, now get these next two words, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and it to command them to keep the law of Moses, reference back to the Gentiles. Okay, yes, we understand that salvation, because these are saved people, is by grace through faith, but it still is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. There's a lot of that today in Reformed circles, at least for that last half of that phrase, to command them to keep the law of Moses. Rather interesting. We'll be talking about that, the Lord willing, as we get a little further along tonight. But to open, let's open in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we're saved by grace through faith. That's not of ourselves, it's the gift of God not of works, no matter what those works are, lest any man should boast. And how, Father, we thank you that we are sanctified through faith that is in Christ Jesus, Paul says so specifically. Sanctification by faith, not by works. Sanctification by faith, not by the law. Sanctification by faith, not by circumcision. That we're set apart for your service by faith, and faith alone. Father, we pray for your blessings upon your word as it goes forth tonight, that our Lord Jesus Christ would be exalted and glorified, and that we might understand that everything is of you and not of us. It is your work, not our work, that saves us. It is your work, the work of the Holy Spirit, not the works of the flesh that sanctify us. And so, Father, we pray for your blessings on your word as it goes forth tonight, that it would not return unto you void, but that it would accomplish that which you please, and that it would prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you recall that last week we finished up chapter 14 with Bulldogs, Battle, and Bitterness, part 2, where we saw the Apostle Paul going to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch. He's returning to the very cities that had sent persecutors after him. He goes back into town after he's been stoned at Lystra. He stays overnight and leaves the next morning and nobody tries to stop him once he gets up out of the rock pile and walks back into town. I'm sure he was a very interesting sight to see, covered with blood, and yet here he is walking into town and perhaps even greeting the very people who had been throwing rocks at him 15 minutes earlier. 
bulldog. That was the Apostle Paul. Paul didn't get bitter. His opponents were bitter. And we learned some very important lessons about bitterness as we were studying that context. The bitterness of the world around us, the bitterness of believers who are out of fellowship, but how we as believers are not to have that as part of our life. It's, it's our responsibility, according to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 30 through 32. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another. It's not just merely the absence of bitterness. There is the positive fruit of the Spirit, which must be reflected in the life of the believer. Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. You never find any place in these passages where the Apostle Paul got bitter, where he held a grudge, where he decided these people are not worth it. I'm not going to witness to them anymore. I'll just let God deal with them. They tried to stone me, okay. Hmm, they're tough luck. They're not going to get the good news again. No, Paul went back. Bitterness will not only defile you, but it will defile and destroy others. Very principal bottom line issue in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 and following. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Paul did that. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Lest, and by the way, God extends his grace to you every time. Not just sometimes, but every time you are tempted to be angry or filled with wrath and malice or have bitterness rising up like an ugly root in your heart, God provides you with the grace to be able to counter that attack of the devil. Very important because you may fail of the grace of God. You may decide, I don't want God's grace this time. I'm going to let that thing explode inside of me. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person, as he saw, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. That's a man who was filled with grief and with sorrow when he suddenly realized that God took him at his word and held him accountable for the things that he had promised. Be careful what you say with your tongue. Be careful what you sing with your mouth. Be careful what you think in your heart and decisions that you decide to make. There comes a point of no return where you may cross a line that you did not even know was there in the dark and you can't get back. Some of you have seen these little traps that they have for mice where there are little wires that sort of just hang down and they're very easy to push one way but they're at an angle. And as the mouse goes in for the bait, he can push right through and he hardly even feels those little metal wires that are rubbing across his back because he's focused on that cheese that's up ahead. He finishes the cheese and he turns around to get back, but those little wires have fallen down and there is no way that he can get back. Dear folks, there are places in the Christian life where we can reach a point of no return. We can be forgiven, but we have crossed a line which produces certain permanent results in our lives, things that cannot be changed. And that's why we saw that there was the comparison with one who is a fornicator. You cross a line there that cannot be returned. You go through some door that cannot be reopened from the inside. The profane person, the person who considers that which is holy to be common. Esau is given as an example, a biblical example, who actually sold a birthright for a pot of bean soup. And he could not get it back. In summary, we learned a total of 35 lessons, but the last second half of the uh, session on Bulldog's Battle and Bitterness, we learned 16 very important lessons about bitterness. The twofold preventative of bitterness is the active pursuit of peace and the active pursuit of holiness.
Two, bitterness can creep in when we're not paying attention. We must actively and diligently be on alert for its seeds. You don't wait till the plant is grown. Number three, bitterness is the result of not appropriating the grace of God when adversity comes into our lives or when other people, quote, do us dirty, when we take up an offense instead of forgiving. Number four, bitterness is a parallel sin to fornication. And as we gave the illustration, there are many little old goody two-shoes people who would never get involved in sex outside of marriage, like in fornication, but they're just as badly polluted with bitterness as the whoremonger and the prostitute. Number five, bitterness is a parallel sin to being profane, treating holy things as though they were common. And that's how Esau treated his birthright with disdain and figured that he would never be held to his promise to trade it for a bowl of bean soup, but he was wrong. Six, bitterness is one of the sins that leads to the point of no return. And we've talked about that in just a moment ago. Both fornication and bitterness have lasting results. Number seven, bitterness can be repented of, but it can never restore the damage that it has done. Number eight, bitterness starts as seeds and proceeds to roots. It does not have to fully flower into a plant before it defiles you and everyone around you. Nine, bitterness always defiles more than the person who has the bitter spirit. It ruins marriages. It ruins friendships. It splits church boards. It splits churches. Bitterness is based on selfishness and defending what we perceive to be our own personal rights. We need to learn to turn our rights over to Christ. Remember, we talked about that. Because he can defend those rights if he wants to, or he can use the violation of your so-called rights to help you mature into a more Christ-like person. Bitterness takes and does not give in love, just like fornication, it takes and does not give. Bitterness builds a wall around you like a fort, but you'll starve to death inside the fort. You become isolated. A bitter spirit is always evident even when you try to hide it, and it always drives people away that you should be trying to reach for Christ. It's definitely not the spirit of Christ that you should cultivate in your garden. Think of Christ on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Bitterness is guaranteed to destroy the fruit of the spirit in your life, love and joy and peace and so on. You have bitterness, it immediately cancels out all nine aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. Bitterness maintains a scorch and burn policy that destroys everything that it touches. And finally, bitterness results in revenge rather than in forgiveness. That's why it's placed in the same category as fornication and the profane person. Instead, we're commanded, be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath Past tense, it's done. Half forgiven you. You don't forgive in order to get forgiven. You have been forgiven. God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. We noted that Jesus has much more to be bitter about against you and against me than we have to be bitter against any other person. Then we concluded with the proper response when somebody attacks you with a bitter spirit. In Acts 14, verses 19 through 21, there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people that having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Albeit the disciples stood round about him, but he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. That's not the great tribulation. That's what we are suffering now at the hands of the world. The great tribulation is the world suffering at the hands of God. There's quite a difference between you suffering from bitter, ugly, unregenerate, degenerate people and those ugly, unrepentant, degenerate, wicked people suffering the judgment of God upon them. We have to go through tribulations. We have to go through trials. We have to go through sufferings in this life. That is not the same thing as what's going to happen to the world when God pours out his wrath in the seven judgments of the seals, the seven judgments of the trumpets, and the seven judgments of the bulls in the book of Revelation. That's God judging the earth. The other is the suffering of believers at the hands of the world. I gave you the illustration about the, the dog. 
It's not the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog. And we talked about that little bulldog against the Irish setter. And we saw that the Apostle Paul is really the Irish, is the bulldog rather than the Irish setter. We talked about the Galatians 6.17 passage. From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. He is obviously mentioning some serious physical confrontations where he had gotten up, beaten up pretty badly on many occasions. We looked at a good number of those. He lists those for us over in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 21 and following. He went through a lot. He had a lot of marks on his body, stigmata on his body as a result of that. The stigmata was the hot iron of a tattoo emblazoned on a slave to show who owned him. And Paul delighted in the fact that that showed that he belonged to Christ. He didn't belong to somebody else. He didn't have perfect skin. <laughs> he had been beaten up pretty badly. He was twisted and torn and ripped and shredded. He was beaten and welts all over his body and wounded in stripes and scars. And he was proud of it because he knew that every one of those was the result of taking a stand for Jesus Christ. We talked about the issue of, well, who is that man that the Apostle Paul was speaking about when he talks about in chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians, where there was this man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth, such an one caught up to the third heaven. And it becomes clear by the time we get down to verse 7 that Paul is talking about himself. Because he says, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. And we all know verses 8 and 9. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. We talked about the timing of the book of 2 Corinthians. We talked about the timing of the missionary journey where Paul was stoned at Lystra. We saw that there's a 14-year span there so that this fits the timing of the writing of 2 Corinthians, and I suspect that that's what Paul is referring to at that point. And so that's what brings us tonight to the Apostle Paul having gotten all the way back to Antioch and he was worn out after that missionary journey. Most folks don't understand what a tremendous spiritual battle, not just the physical battle, but a tremendous spiritual battle it is to be involved in Christian ministry. I've never suffered anything like the Apostle Paul had to suffer. I've never been beaten or stoned or hit with whips and rods and rocks and, you know, had shipwrecks. I'm sure hope I don't ever have a shipwreck. I'm getting too old to swim these days. But, you know, you think about what Paul went through. He was worn out at the end of that missionary journey. And so it tells us that when he got back, that he stayed a long time at Antioch. It was sort of like his furlough, rest and relaxation. In fact, he might have even thought at that time, Praise the Lord, I got my job done. I have finished what God has called me to do. Little did he know how much more God had called him to do. The Apostle Paul was glad to be back. He was glad to be among friends. He was glad to be among Christians who believed the same thing that he did, who appreciated his teaching, who showed up for church, who came together for fellowship meals, who were eager and excited about witnessing to their lost neighbors, Paul was home. That was the first place that the believers were called Christians. What a testimony that church had. But how easy it is for us to fall into that kind of relaxation when we're in the group of believers around us and God has to jog us back into reality and tell us there are other battles out there that you must fight. And that's what moves us into chapter 15 where we saw in Verses 1 and following, certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. That is a direct frontal attack on the gospel of salvation. Paul was the warrior whom God had called to proclaim salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone. 
Paul was the man on the front lines. Paul was the commanding general. Paul was the man who broke through into enemy territory. Paul was the leader of the commandos. Paul was the one who snuck under the barbed wire, under enemy fire, who charged the enemy, who came back victorious with tremendous success. And now a new challenge has arisen and it's coming out of Jerusalem of all places. How easy it is for us to sit complacently by and have all kinds of exciting things going on on the outside and see the missionaries out on the field doing wonderful works and not realize that there may be some who have infiltrated the ranks and who are seeking to turn men aside from the grace of God. That's what was happening while Paul was on his missionary journey. While the watchdog was away, the vermin began to enter the chicken coop. Certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren. Here we have some folks coming from Judea and from Jerusalem, and we'll see that there was some left behind who held a slightly different variation of this doctrine. But here are men who've come from Judea out to Antioch. And suddenly Paul catches wind of it. Suddenly somebody brings him a report, or maybe it was Barnabas, because it tells us that Barnabas and Saul and Paul made, had no small dissension and disputation with them. So the church decided, we've got to settle this issue once and for all. Here are Paul and Barnabas. They're clearly men who have hazarded their lives for the Lord Jesus Christ. Here they are, have come back, have told us the tremendous things that God did while they were on this missionary journey. The thousands of people that came to Christ. The multiplicity of churches that had been established that were growing in grace because they had not only started them and gone out, but they came back and visited every one of those churches and commended them to the grace of God. They were real conversions. There are real churches planted. Gentiles are really being saved. There is a sweeping movement of the Spirit of God across the, the ancient world, and in that particular case, across Turkey, where at one point, before Islam swept across and murdered the Christians, there were thousands of churches as a result of the work that Paul had done. And now another group comes in and says, don't you realize they've got a defective gospel? They've only got a partial gospel. They're leaving out some of the key issues of the gospel. Why, they're leaving out something that is a very important thing. And you ought to know that. Because after all, think back to the promises to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob and to the law of Moses. Was God merely wasting his breath when he gave the law of Moses at Mount Sinai? Has God changed his moral character? Because after all, he told them that they had to be circumcised upon pain of death. How could God change something like that? Do you think that God has changed his moral standards? Why, we must be under the Ten Commandments is our rule of life. There are people there today and in reform circles who are telling you that the standard for the Christian is the Ten Commandments. No, the standard for the Christian is Jesus Christ and being empowered by the Spirit of God, not by the flesh. We've talked about that in the past. And so they had pushed it to its logical conclusion. There is much that fits logic and reason that does not fit revelation. Don't twist the words of scripture when you have a choice between I must follow my reason or I must follow revelation even if I don't understand it. Always follow revelation in scripture, not a new bolt of blue out of the atmosphere that suddenly hits you with a grand and glorious new vision of Jesus, like the charismatic skit. Follow scripture. Revelation is what's important. We'll talk about that in a few moments as to how you can tell what's for you and what's not for you. How you can tell what applies to the church today and what does not. How you can understand the difference between the principle upon which you found your faith and results of the faith that come back to certain things that God has revealed. Very important to make those distinctions as we'll see in a few moments.
And so we have the men who are teaching that circumcision is necessary for salvation, and it's circumcision after the manner of Moses. They don't merely go back to circumcision, which was given to Abraham. It has to be circumcision after the manner of Moses. That is, the Mosaic law applied in visible practice to the Christian. Now, in case you haven't noticed, circumcision happened to be the big issue facing the church in Acts. It wasn't baptism or the Lord's table. It wasn't predestination, election, and all the rest of the big five that we talk about. It wasn't the form of government of the local church. It wasn't fights at the level of the General Assembly or Synod over homosexuality and abortion. It was circumcision. The issue of circumcision had already come up four times in Acts by the time we reached the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. This is the fifth time that circumcision is mentioned in the book of Acts. In fact, circumcision wasn't merely one of the many topics debated at that council. It was the key topic debated at the very first all-church council here in Acts chapter 15. God gives it a whole chapter. We ought to be able to learn something from that. And we'll learn something as we get farther into the chapter, not merely about circumcision, but about the applications of the principles established by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem for every church fight that ever arises. This was the key issue, but it was an issue that resulted not merely in a narrow decision. It's an issue that resulted in basic principles for determining how to resolve these fights that come up in local churches and in the church at large. Remember the context that we have here. Paul and Barnabas have just returned from their missionary journey, have been spending quality time in Antioch, that great time of rest, but Satan has been busy infiltrating the church at Jerusalem without the apostles and the elders even being aware of it. That often happens in churches, in groups of churches. Satan is busy infiltrating while the church is busy sleeping. Something else that hits me very interesting here, a second wave of missionaries had been hitting the field, but this group was carrying a different message. It's different because it is a mixture of law and grace in at least two different areas. Law and grace for salvation, law and grace for sanctification. That first group we already saw in verse 1, certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. That's as straightforward as you can get. Salvation by circumcision, not salvation by grace, not salvation by faith, salvation by circumcision. The second group is seen down here in verse 5. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed. Now these are guys who have come out of a very strict and rigid form of Judaism. A form of Judaism that took the scripture seriously. A form of Judaism that believed in a real God. A form of Judaism that believed in angels and the resurrection and so on. In contrast to the Sadducees who normally held control, who were a bunch of atheists but who were wearing religious garb. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in the resurrection. You remember the debates that Jesus had as we look through the Gospels with the Pharisees and with the Sadducees and the different approaches that they took as they tried to stop what Jesus was doing in teaching the truth of God's word. Different approaches by the devil, but both attacking Christ. Here are Pharisees who have actually trusted Christ and believed. They had started with the premise that the scripture is true. Much easier to deal with someone who starts with that premise that the scripture is true, that there really is a God, there really are angels, there really is heaven, there really is a resurrection, there really is a supernatural, there really is a spiritual warfare going on. At least you can take them back to scripture to show them things. But here they are, they're starting with scripture and they've got the Old Testament. Most of the New Testament has not been written at this point. And so after they've studied their Old Testaments, and they're taking their Old Testament seriously, and they've really seen that Christ is the Messiah, and they've really trusted in him because it says they believed. This is a group of saved people, but they've come out of that kind of a background. People come from different backgrounds. As a result, they bring with them various baggage, which comes into the church with them. That's why it's so important to have continuous Bible teaching 
continuous understanding of the scripture so that people can grow in grace no matter what they come from in terms of their background, whether it is voodoo paganism or whether it's Pharisaic legalism. They all need to find the heart of the gospel and then they all need to find the heart of Christian living. Salvation, sanctification. Being set apart for the work of Christ and doing it in the power of the spirit, not in the power of the flesh. So here we have believers in verse 5, but they're saying, quote, that it was needful. It's needed. It's not optional. It's needful to circumcise them and not just suggest that they follow the principles of the law of Moses and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Folks, that battle is still going on today. Now, I understand that nine of the Ten Commandments are restated in the New Testament. But those, the one that's not restated is the law of the Sabbath. But those nine commandments are not stated for the believer on the basis of the law at Sinai. They're stated in the context of our love for Christ. And they go farther than the Old Testament law of Moses ever required. For example, Old Testament, Law of Moses said, Thou shalt not steal. New Testament, writings of Paul, Let him that stole steal no more. That so seems okay, the same thing thus far. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor with his hands that he may have to give to him that needeth. Does that go farther than the command, Thou shalt not steal? It certainly did, does. Not quit stealing, but work. You want something, you get a job. You want something, you earn it and pay for it. But not just that. You work, you get money, you don't steal. But now, remember that resource does not belong to you. It belongs to Christ that he may have to give to him that needeth. The law is minimalistic. The law just sets these very rigid boundaries. And so someone who thinks he's kept the law can say, good, I don't have to worry about anything else. Jesus said, the law said, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman with lust in his heart hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. That goes beyond what was required by the law and it requires a relationship with Christ and empowerment that we do not have in the flesh. It is the power of the Spirit of God. No, the law is not the standard for the believer today. Christ is the standard and the Holy Spirit is the empowerer who enables us to do what is right. You try to keep the law in the flesh and you will wear yourself out. So here were believers, Jewish believers, who had grown up under the law and who were now saying, well, really, okay, salvation is by grace through faith. They had believed. They were saved. They were still in the church at Jerusalem. They hadn't gotten out on the mission field. It was those guys teaching salvation in another way who would gotten out on the mission field. But they're saying it's needful. Really, it's an easier way of figuring out the Christian life. And that's what a lot of people do. They figure, man, all that other stuff, there's way too much to learn. If I just learn the Ten Commandments, hey, I'm okay. I'll just sort of follow those mechanically every day. Folks, the Christian life is a lot more exciting than trying to follow the Ten Commandments. It really is. It's a lot more joyful. It's a lot more exuberant. It's a lot more filled with the Spirit of God and actual ministry instead of trying to be picky, picky, picky. Have I just followed this rule? How we thank God for His grace. Oh, we all fail miserably all the time. But hey, if the law is necessary for either salvation or sanctification, neither one of those things are going to get us anywhere in our Christian life. So that's one of the big issues that's being talked about here. Pharisees which believe they're saved, teaching a different way of 
not merely salvation, but of sanctification, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them. Not suggest, command, 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 command. Got to keep the law of Moses. Got to keep the law of Moses. Hey, have you kept the law of Moses today? How about the seventh commandment? How about the ninth commandment? How about the tenth commandment? How about the second commandment? How about the first commandment? Probably all of you know them. They're in the catechism. Command them to keep the law of Moses. The council is going to be dealing with those issues. And it's going to come to the conclusion that the law of Moses is not what is required for either salvation or sanctification. Acts 15 settles that issue. It doesn't merely settle the issue of circumcision, though that issue is included. It settles the issue of what is necessary for salvation and what is necessary for sanctification. Now, you know what we see happening here in Acts 15 is very much like what I call the second and third wave missionaries that are hitting the field today, teaching like contextualized gospel, changing entire symbols in the text, such as, and this is a real translation that was done for some Eskimo tribe, behold the baby seal of God that taketh away the sin of the world. The people who said, who did the translation said, well, after all, these Eskimos have never seen a lamb. So, but they have seen seals and they know that baby seals are really sweet and nice, you know. And it, So here's a, a sweet little baby seal. And so we translated, behold the baby seal, because that's something they understand. Behold the baby seal, which taketh away the sin of the world. The next day, John, Jesus coming in. Can you imagine that? In the context of Israel, the rocks and the heat and the briars and all the difficult parts of that land. You've seen some of them on the videos that I've shown. And then you throw this picture into it. Behold the baby seal of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Gibberish. Dear people, by making that kind of a translation, they're missing the entire rich Old Testament picture of the sacrificial lamb. The children of Israel at Passover did not sacrifice a baby seal. That's not the picture that God gave. How dare we change what God has given to us? God gave it for a purpose because it portrays Christ. The Lamb is the one who is standing as it had been slain in the book of Revelation. You don't see a slain baby seal standing in the book of Revelation. When we change things like that, and this is the second, third wave of missionaries that are going out in these days, you defile the word of God, you turn it into rubbish, you mock it and scorn it and deny the God who gave his word in human language. Behold the Lamb of God. One of the things that has bothered me over the last year is changing the character of Christ in many of the translations that are coming out by these missionaries, especially in translations to Muslim people groups, where the father is no longer called the father, he's called the guardian. And the son is no longer called the son, he's called the blessed one or some other thing like that. When God speaks, he does not stutter. He expressed a relationship that he himself has determined and by which he has revealed himself in this world. He says what he means. The words communicate with precision what he means. I'd spend a lot more time talking about that tonight, but I've already done that. For a more in-depth study, I recommend that you read the paper I wrote and presented to the Dean Bergen Society annual meeting last summer entitled Islam and the King James Bible. You can also see it and hear it on the Dean Bergen website where the whole sermon was downloaded. You want to see with some missionaries, many missionaries, in fact, many evangelical missionaries because they bought into the contextualization idea are now doing on the mission field. Did you realize that for a two year period there was a huge upset and uproar in Wycliffe translators one of the finest missionary translation groups on the face of the earth, 
where many of their missionaries had gotten into this and where word got out and where a tremendous backlash came from the churches that were supporting them because they were no longer translating the word of God. They were making it up as they went. It goes all the way back to preceding the Council of Jerusalem where the missionaries were changing what God had said. Where they were bringing false doctrine and penetrating and infiltrating and polluting the churches. Ruining the mission field for those who would come and bring the true word of God. Reminds me of what happened with the Seventh-day Adventists when they came out to Pitcairn's Island where those who were the descendants of the mutineers on the ship Her Majesty's The Bounty were still surviving and now that island is controlled by Seventh-day Adventism. Far to reach with the gospel of Christ, very limited access to that place. People, it's happened, it's happening. It will continue to happen. Satan will continue to infiltrate and try to destroy the message. Second and third wave missionaries. Let me remind you of a few things that we looked at in the morning service more than a month ago. Circumcision was a serious issue to the Jews because it was a very serious issue with God under the old covenant of the Mosaic law. Let me pick it up there in Exodus 4, which we looked at a long time ago in Exodus, but it ties in with what is going on in Acts 15. Moses is on his way to obey God. He is on his way to confront Pharaoh in Exodus chapter 4. And it came to pass, by the way, in the end, that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. And Zipporah, which means a little bird, took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. So he let him go and then she said, A bloody husband art thou because of the circumcision. Let me just remind you very quickly of seven lessons that we learned out of that passage. First lesson, never think that you're going to get away with something just because you have made a little forward progress. We talked about sins of omission. Second lesson was, don't think you'll get away with something just because God has called you and given you a new assignment. Think of sins of commission. We see Moses involved with both of those because he had not yet circumcised his son. Third lesson is, don't think that God will not embarrass you in front of other people. Shame is one of the things that he uses to bring us into line. Remember, this happened at an inn, not in a desert place. Fourth lesson, God is serious about his commands to the point of killing you. He did that with Ananias and Sapphira. He did that in 1 Corinthians with those who were coming to the Lord's table without having taken care of their sins in advance. Some of those people at Corinth had gotten sick and some of them had died because they were violating the principles of God's word. Serious issues. The fifth lesson, excuse me, the fourth lesson, one of the commands given to Abraham and his descendants through Isaac was circumcision. It was the mark of distinction for the Jewish people. Moses was going to be the leader of the Jewish people. Moses had to set an example, so don't ever take God for granted and think that you can ignore what he has commanded if it applies to you. Fifth lesson, very important fifth lesson. We talked a little bit about that this morning, which is don't let peer pressure or even your spouse cause you to neglect what God has told you to do. You know, Ruth was under some severe peer pressure. She was perhaps even feeling some rejection from her mother-in-law, whom she loved dearly. Naomi, who was going through a crisis point in her life as she returned home, wondering what people would say about her. We see that from the way that Naomi responded when they called her Naomi, and she said, call me Mara, because the hand of the Almighty is against me. Ruth had every example to follow Orpah back to her own people to her own gods. Dear people, peer pressure is deadly. Peer pressure often makes believers who are committed to scripture waver and then crumble and then disobey the word of God. Don't let peer pressure, even your spouse, 
cause you to neglect what God has told you to do. It's obvious that Sabora was the one who opposed the circumcision because of the way she responded. Number six, don't assume that any of the things that God has commanded you to do are little things or insignificant things. In fact, they might be very big things in the overall plan of God. And Moses wasn't taking that into account. Circumcision was to be the outward visible sign of males who were part of the covenant people of God. Remember now, this is all the stuff that's in the mind of the Pharisees at Jerusalem who said that it was needful for them to be circumcised, that is the Gentiles, and needful to command them to keep the law of Moses. This is the background for what those men were thinking. They'd studied that passage in Exodus 4. They'd seen what God did when Moses didn't circumcise his son. The seventh lesson is don't confuse pre-law commands with the law of Moses. It's very important because it directly applies to circumcision. Although the sign was the same, the reasoning and responsibility was different. We're not under the law of Moses. New Testament tells us that multiple times. Circumcision was given before the law as a sign of God's covenant with his covenant people descended from Abraham. Now we find it restated under the law, but it predated the law. And that's part of the confusion and the false teaching that underlies the conflict that we see here in Acts chapter 15. The believing Jews were saying that believers had to be circumcised and to keep the law of Moses. Those were different than those Jewish missionaries who were teaching circumcision as a means of salvation. Remember what Stephen said, Acts chapter 7, verse 8, it was given before Moses. And gave unto him the covenant of circumcision, and so Abraham begat Isaac, and circumcised him the eighth day, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs. This is 400 years before Mount Sinai. Jesus talked about it in John chapter 7, verse 22. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. Jesus makes it clear circumcision didn't come only as a result of the law of Moses. It was given to the fathers. That's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the twelve sons of Jacob. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receive circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken. In other words, there were exceptions to circumcising on the eighth day, which was a command of the law of Moses. Are ye angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? So what is it that Jesus is saying here about circumcision? Theologically, this is what we call a transdispensational principle. Something may be established at one point in time that continues to remain, even when God makes some changes in his household structure, as he clearly does at various points in Bible history. Now that term dispensations is the term that the New Testament uses, even though it's a very unpopular word in Presbyterian circles. Dispensations, that is. Dispensations, oikonomia, simply means household law. It comes from oikos, which means a house, and nomos, which means law, household law. The head of the house can change the rules at different periods of time. For example, you'll understand this. You've all been children at one point or another. The father does not have to have a rule that his five-year-old cannot drive the car during the week, but only on the weekends. He does not make that rule for his five-year-old. You get it? <laughs> child isn't ready to drive. Child doesn't get the rule. Another illustration. He does not have to restrict his three-year-old to get in from his dates by 10 p.m. No father gives his child the rule, who's 23 years old, you got to be home from your date by 10 p.m. Rules change as children mature. Paul specifically says that the law was given to God's people while they were still in the childhood state, that is, prior to the coming of Christ. Let me just read to you a couple of passages out of the book of Galatians. If you have your Bibles, turn with me there, because these are some extended passages, and I'll be jumping through verses just to get to those passages that are talking about the law. Turn with me first, if you will, to Galatians chapter 3. 
And these passages deal with the law and with circumcision. Galatians chapter 3, and I'll begin reading in verse 18. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. So in other words, God put the law in as a stopgap measure until we would come to the one to whom the promise was made, that is Christ. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? Because after all, he's been talking about promises that God gave to Abraham. And then he talks about the law that was given through Moses. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily the righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, now listen carefully, this is a very key passage in understanding what's going on in the minds of the council at Jerusalem in chapter 15. This is what Paul was preaching. This was what was being challenged by the Judaizers. And so now Paul is summarizing for us what we're going to see develop in its infancy at the council of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up, like locked in, under the faith which should afterward be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster, the slave who was entrusted with the rearing of the children, who got to beat the kids if they didn't do their lessons. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. That's why I said earlier, the law of Moses is not the standard of living for the Christian. It's the new relationship that we have to Christ, empowered by the Spirit of God, who can accomplish in your life what the law could never accomplish. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. That's a very, very, very important passage. Jump over to chapter 4. We're talking about the law again. We're talking about the schoolmaster. Now I say that the heir, that is, the son who's going to inherit everything, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Listen to verse 3. He's telling us what our relationship was when we were under the schoolmaster, whom he has defined in verse 25 of chapter 3 as the law. Even so, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them, to buy them back that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Because ye are sons, of, because ye are sons God hath sent forth his spirit of his son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Albeit then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire to be in bondage? And now he's going to tell you about the law. Where did Paul get this, this next list that he comes up with? Ye observe days and months and times and years. They put themselves back under the Jewish calendar for all the Jewish feasts, not recognizing that those feasts have been fulfilled in Christ. I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. You have not injured me. Down to verse 21. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? Oh, my. How many people desire to be under the law? It's a simple way of doing things. It's not clutter up our lives with all that other New Testament stuff. Just grab your Ten Commandments and go with it. 
For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. Now he's going to compare the bondwoman and the flesh with the law. Listen to that carefully. He's going to compare the bondwoman, that is Hagar, with the flesh and tell us that it illustrates the law. But, ye, but he of the free woman was by promise, which things are an allegory, for there are two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage. What's the covenant that came from Mount Sinai? That's the law of Moses. It genders to bondage. Gendereth means to bear children who will be slaves. Dulea is the word that's used there. Gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. That's Hagar in the Old Testament writing. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, which, by the way, tells you where Sinai is located. It's not located in the Sinai Peninsula. It's located in Arabia. And answereth to Jerusalem, which is now, and is in bondage with her children. The Jews at Jerusalem are still in bondage. Why? Because they still have placed themselves back under the law of Moses. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all, the heavenly Jerusalem. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Oh my, as we look at this passage here and as we look down through the rest to verse 26, we see a tremendous way in which God has made it clear that we're no longer under bondage. Listen to what he says. Now, brethren, as Isaac was, are the ch now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh, there's the law, persecuted him that was born after the spirit. Those are the believers who walk by faith. You're going to get persecuted by them who are under the law. Even so it is now. Nevertheless, what says the scripture? That is the question you must always go back to. What saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, that's the law, that's Hagar, that's Mount Sinai, but of the free. And he moves into chapter 5, and oh, as we read through that, I mean, there's tremendous amount in here. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. That's the law. That's our context. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, oh, here we have that issue again. He's still fighting it. That he is a debtor to do the whole law. You make circumcision a requirement. You take one part of the law. You take the whole work with you. I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. We've talked about being falling from grace. Bitterness is a rejection of the grace of God extended towards you. Placing yourself under the law is placing yourself in rejection of the grace of God extended to you. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, now listen, here's the answer to the second group in Acts 15 verse 5. They were saying circumcision is needful. They were believers. The Galatians were believers. They understood that you couldn't be circumcised for salvation. That's Acts 15.1. Now we're dealing with Acts 15.5. Those Jews said it was needful. Listen to what Paul says. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, it doesn't do you any good one way or the other, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Folks, why do you do what you do? It's one of the principles that's going to come out of Acts chapter 15, not just what do you do, although that's important. The issue is, why do you do what you do? 
If you're saying that it's needed for salvation, you're wrong. If you're saying it's needful for sanctification and keeping the law and circumcision and all the stuff that goes with it, because if you require circumcision, you are a debtor to do the whole law. Those Jews there in Acts 15, 5 understood that. They said it's needful for them to be circumcised and to keep the law of Moses. Paul says here, you want to go with circumcision as a requirement? Then you've got to keep the whole law. But then he tells us, in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth. It, it doesn't do you good, and it doesn't do you harm. Neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, by faith which worketh by love. You did run well. What did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? It's not a matter of merely believing. It's a matter of obeying. This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will come, will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment. There were those there in Galatia, as Paul was writing this epistle, who were pushing circumcision in the law. Verse 11, And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. Does the cross not fulfill the law, those who were pushing this as a needful, necessary thing, were saying the cross did not fulfill the law. There are ramifications that go far beyond our mere petty arguments on the surface. And so what Paul say about those people who were persecuting, he says, I would that they were even cut off, that means castrated, which trouble you. Don't just do circumcision, cut it all off. That's what I wish would happen to those guys. Paul's rather hot on this topic, as you can guess, after his battle at the Synod in Jerusalem. Look down here at verse 18. If you're led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Verses 22 through 26, but the fruit of the Spirit is circumcision, and the Ten Commandments. No, it doesn't say that, does it? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, listen to the last phrase, against such there is no law. You get the idea Paul's dealing with issues about the law versus grace as we read the book of Galatians. He is contending with those who say you've got to be circumcised and it's necessary to keep the law of Moses. He's still fighting a battle that the false missionaries were bringing and had first brought to Antioch where Paul got into discussion with them and went to Jerusalem to resolve the issue with the apostles and elders. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. It's not the law that crucified your affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. It's not a matter of walking in obedience to the law. It's a matter of walking in the Spirit. Now, certain results will be the same. You won't do certain things. You will do other things. But the basis, the foundation, is totally different. How oh, I wish we could understand that. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another and envying one another. Now, some rules that God gives, just like in our families, may remain even after a child matures. You know some of the obvious examples from real life. For example, we teach our little kids and we expect it to last all the rest of their lives. Don't start eating until everyone is at the table and a prayer of thanks is said. Or, brush your teeth every day and take a shower so that you don't stink. <laughs> we don't expect them by the time they grow up to stop brushing their teeth and then stop taking showers. Those are things that move throughout the child's life all the way until they're old. We hope everybody who's old still brushes their teeth and takes showers too. Let me show you a biblical example of how this transdispensational principle works. For example, God established marriage before the fall of Adam and Eve. He certainly did not abolish marriage after the fall, though we move into a different economy of the way in which God is doing things with his people. Now he's dealing not with innocent people, he's dealing with sinful people. But he doesn't abolish marriage after the fall or any of the principles that he ordained for marriage. For example, one man for one woman for life. Death alone breaks the marriage bond. 
moral purity before, during, and after marriage. Headship of the husband who must honor, love, and protect his wife. Gentle obedience submission of the wife to her own husband. Heterosexuality, not homosexuality or bestiality. The list could go on. Now let's talk about how that applies to circumcision. The issue that the Council of Jerusalem had to wrestle with under the two pronged attack against grace. Concerning circumcision, there are three important key premises. Number one, it's clear that circumcision was given prior to the giving of the law to Moses. Number two, it was restated and required upon penalty of death under the law. Three, it is permitted, though not required, and certainly not upon penalty of death, after Christ fulfilled the law at the cross and the resurrection. That being said, we must strongly emphasize that the basis for circumcision and all the other external works that are done by man, baptism, Lord's table, confirmation, and so on, Things that are after the cross are never on the basis of the law. After the cross, those things relate to other principles. For example, the Apostle Paul circumcised Timothy as a testimony to the Jews who knew that his Jewish mother had married a Greek. You can read it in Acts 16.3. And this is Paul who's preaching against circumcision, but he did it for Timothy for a different reason than being under the law. It was given as uh, the illustration of Paul doing this to Timothy was to give Timothy more opportunity to spread the gospel among Jews without having a secondary issue stand in the way. However, as you also know, Paul refused to circumcise Titus because the Jewish legalists wanted to make circumcision a requirement for Gentile converts. That's Galatians 2, 3 through 6. Uh, we looked at some of the passages around that a moment ago. The issue is, why are you doing what you are doing? In that case, it was a refusal to do an act that might indicate the necessity of going back under the law. There are neutral reasons also, like medical reasons for circumcision. Those are theologically neutral in terms of general religious reasons. For example, there's less cervical cancer in women whose husbands are circumcised. Circumcision can take place for genital and urinary tract obstructions for deformities and so on. But circumcision is never right as a requirement for putting a believer back under the law of Moses. Circumcision is not necessary for salvation. Circumcision is not necessary for sanctification. Paul says so, Romans 4, verse 9 and following. Come this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. Now listen to Paul's argument here. How was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, being yet uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe. Though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them. In other words, Abraham had righteousness imputed to his account. He was saved. He grew in his faith. He was the friend of God. He walked by faith long before he was circumcised. That's important. It was a sign that God gave to him, but his righteousness and his growth did not depend upon his circumcision. He was the father of the circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but also walk in the steps of faith that our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law. Folks, your promise of righteousness is not the law. That's what he said but through the righteousness of faith. That is the foundation of the Protestant Reformation. That is the heritage out of which we come. It's not the law, it's grace and faith. Abraham was not saved or sanctified by circumcision because he was saved by faith before he was circumcised. However, he was then circumcised as a sign and a seal that he believed 
the promises of God. The physical act of circumcision is not what was important. The key issue is your relationship with God by faith, of which circumcision may, in some cases, be the visible sign. Galatians 5, 6, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. He says it again in verse 15, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Your changed life, your sanctification, does not come about as a result of circumcision. 1 Corinthians 7.18, Is any man called being uncircumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Uh, Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. That's not the issue. He's writing to the Corinthians. He's rebutting the the false missionaries that were going out there and teaching it was necessary for salvation or sanctification. Verse 19, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God. Now, wait a minute, Paul. I thought that we weren't going back under the law. Well, Paul makes that very clear. If you read the context, you discover that what he's talking about there is the movement of the Spirit of God in the heart of the believer which fulfills the ultimate righteousness of Christ in us. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. So that context indicates that there are certain conditions and under certain conditions where changes can be made. Married, widowed, unmarried, he's talking about in context, servant and free, that's the context, but the changes are not required. So back to our text. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them, notice, they take with them witnesses. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. You know, even with Paul and Barnabas, somebody could say, well, they're the only ones who went back and they bring back this report. And how do we know they didn't change the report? Because after all, I mean, they want to push for their own position. They want to put their own position in the best possible light. So they go up to Jerusalem. They talk to the elders. They come back to us. They tell us, hey, guys, we're okay. Those are still the bad guys. No, they sent others with them. Those who were neutral parties, those who had heard both sides of the argument, and all of them go up to Jerusalem to talk to the apostles and prophets. That's a principle that still is available today. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, shall every word be established. And being brought on their way by the church, the responsibility of each individual local church to care for those who are traveling through carrying the gospel of Christ, certainly with missionaries. They pass through Phoenicia and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. They were bringing good testimony wherever they went. They were speaking a lot of churches along the way. They caused great joy unto all the brethren. You know, it's interesting how God removed that bitterness and that stigma of racism that had permeated the Jewish believers in the Old Testament. And now suddenly we move into the body of Christ and Jews and Samaritans and Gentiles now all look to being one. caused great joy unto all the brethren, and when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church, and of the apostles, and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. Well, our time is way past time tonight, but next week, the Lord willing, we hope to start looking at how the council applied the general principles of this specific discussion to other areas of the Christian life and witness and testimony. Let's close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you very much again for your word and for its power. We thank you that you have given to us specific illustrations that are easy for us to understand, very visible and very clear in fleshly terms, so that we can understand deeper principles that relate to the Word of God. Those surface issues are indeed important, and great battles were fought over them in the early church. But by that, you gave us illustration as to how we are to live the Christian life, how we are free from the law. Although what we do in the power of the Spirit will indeed not merely manifest the law, but it will go beyond what the law ever required, which we certainly could not do in the flesh. But by the Spirit of God, we can do it. Father, help us to learn that, to learn it in practical ways, 
not to simply place ourselves slavishly back under the schoolmaster, which was designed to bring us to Christ. And when we've come to Christ, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. But now our full-grown sons, both by birth and by adoption, and with new responsibilities and privileges as well as new rights, we tend to focus on our rights, but the privileges must always be balanced with responsibility and with obligation, and they are given the power to do it, because we have your indwelling Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. We pray that you will take it and use it in our hearts, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight is hymn number 279.